Since uh, I'm not used to give speeches in English, I prepared a uh, prepared, uh, paper. But uh, because I will uh, speak about my country, I prefer to, to do it uh, in a spontaneous way from the heart. So, first, let me uh, uh, thank you uh, for this uh, kind of invitation and uh, to allow me. Uh, to have an exchange with you and to explain and to present the situation in Tunisia today. Uh, as you know, uh, Tunisia was the first uh, country where uh, the revolution occurred three years ago. Uh, it was made by uh, leaderless, political leaderless people, young people, educated, uh, without uh, jobless people. And the aim of that revolution was uh, not, not fully political. It was more uh, people, uh, young people look, uh, looking for job, uh, looking for opportunities, looking for freedom. And it was uh, the specificity of uh, that revolution. It was connected people. It was one of the media of uh, this revolution was uh, internet and, uh, and Facebook. Uh, during these last uh, three years, uh, this period was political. The revolution was not at uh, the beginning, but the period was political. It was uh, a hard, a hard period for the country, since uh, it was a dispute. Uh, the, there was more. Uh, uh, we, we started the revolution with only five or six parties, and I think we should have uh, more than 160. So you can imagine the market and, uh, and the situations. So, uh, but. Uh, Fortunately, you know uh, that uh, since a couple of months, we found uh, a peaceful way to close uh, this uh, political uh, crisis. Uh, it's interesting maybe to spend some time explaining the way they do. Uh, I think it's uh, more the nature of the Tunisian people. We are uh, really moderate people. It's uh, known in the history, it's in the behavior, it's in the composition of the Tunisian to be uh, really medium in the middle and good race. So after fighting, uh, they realized that there is no solution. The only solution possible it was with the dialogue. And the original way to do and to lead this dialogue uh, was set up uh, by the initiative of uh, four organizations, civil uh, organization, uh, led by the labor, by the labor uh, UGTT and uh, the labor union, uh, with collaboration uh, with the chamber, trade and uh, trade and uh, industrial chamber, and uh, the league of uh, human rights, and as well the fourth. And that's why we call uh, them the quartet because they are four parties. The fourth one is the order of uh, lawyers. So it was not easy. But it was a converging process uh, which led to uh, the vote, which helped us to vote uh, a constitution, a unique constitution for uh, that uh, area, which uh, guarantees the fundamental and universal uh, rights, the rights of uh, equality uh, between genders, between uh, women and uh, men. Uh, but as well uh, the freedom of uh, conscience, the freedom of worship, uh, so many freedom, many uh, uh, many universal uh, values. Uh, in fact, it's not surprising from Tunisia when we know the history of Tunisia, when we know that uh, in 1846 we were in that area the first country uh, proceeding to the abolition of slavery. In the 1857 uh, or say 58, uh, we got the first constitutional chart. So it's a tradition, constitution in Tunisia. And uh, in uh, 1956, the first year after the independence, uh, we adopted as well the equality between women and, uh, and men. So it was in the trend of the history, and it was in the nature of uh, that country. Uh, so today uh, we are in the last step of this uh, political phase. Uh, the dialogue uh, uh, as well allowed to set up a government, 
which is which I'm leading since two months now, a government of non-political people, a uh, government of competences. So we gathered uh, many competences. Some of them are coming from this uh, head. I think we have uh, one of them here who was uh, <laughs> who knows this place uh, and he helped to organize uh, this uh, this meeting from uh, from everywhere in the world. Uh, I, I was living in France, uh, some of them was uh, uh, <coughs> in Geneva, in, uh, in uh, Brazil, uh, everywhere. And uh, our main uh, aim today is uh, to lead the country to, uh, to fair, equal, and well-organized uh, elections, which will close this transition political period. But to do that, we have uh, to offer the right climate. It's not enough to agree. Uh, we have to offer security. You know that uh, this uh, last years with uh, this trouble in Tunisia, uh, this revolution, which uh, shaked the state, and uh, as well, well all, uh, what happens all around <coughs> the region, this uh, instability, uh, it allows uh, some of the extremist groups to have uh, and to get a foot in Tunisia and to proceed to some terrorist uh, acts, uh, which uh, strange form. It's we are not used with that. That's why they succeeded for the first time because we were not prepared. But uh, this last uh, year and uh, maybe since uh, two or three months, we succeeded really to find them and to give them. Uh, a serious, uh, serious defeat, uh, but we know that uh, we still, like any country of the world, even uh, the powerful country, that we still subjected to this threat, and that we have to prepare ourselves to uh, to secure uh, our country. Uh, you know uh, what is happening on our borders, uh, so uh, we have to uh, to ensure the security of our borders and for that we have an open collaboration with all our friendly countries among them United States we have good relationship as you know with the United States uh, the first relations we got in the 1799 so we were among the first countries recognizing the United States and the uh, United States was uh, among the first countries recognizing the independence of Tunisia. So we have a deep and good relationship with the United States. So we are collaborating <coughs> on many aspects, security, but as well economy. As you know, uh, the aim, uh, the first aim of my visit here in the United States is to start a strategic, a strategic uh, dialogue, uh, which will strengthen our relationship. Uh, so it will be really uh, a complete uh, dialogue about security, but about economy, finance, but as well technologies and uh, education, so many aspects. So to come back to the situation in Tunisia today, uh, really we succeeded to stabilize uh, the political uh, and to uh, solve the political main, the main and the major political issues for the security. Tunisia is safer each day uh, than it was before, and uh, we have good indicator. Now we have uh, tourism, which is growing up again. You know, after the revolution, there was a fall in the uh, in the number of uh, the tourists, uh, and you know that Tunisia it's a, a nice destination for tourists. European people know that uh, more, but uh, we hope that we see uh, in the near future more American as well. You will appreciate. Uh, each time I was. Uh, I was, uh, in my previous business, I was always traveling to California, and each time I land in California, it reminds me of Tunisia. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we are progressing on all of that, but uh, we discovered that after three years of uh, political trouble, uh, we forget the economy, but the economy did not forget us. So, we have many issues now to, uh, to check. Uh, the main issues is uh, they are related to the uh, the budget, uh, the budget to the state uh, budget. So we have uh, with the big pressures, social pressures, with this trouble, 
uh, there was uh, an increase in the wages of uh, the administration uh, since uh, this revolution was, was made by uh, people uh, who were uh, looking uh, for jobs. There was a pressure on the state to hire a lot of people. And so today we have a heavy budget for this administration people. And as well, we have a subsidi subsidized uh, system, uh, which becomes heavy because uh, uh, you know since uh, 2009, the increase of uh, the oil prices, uh, it affects the budget of the state. So, and with a limited growth, we were used to 5% growth a year. Uh, and uh, since the revolution, the average should be around two or three, uh, which is not uh, good because we need uh, more than that to create jobs, which is not so bad when we know that we were in a revolution period. And uh, uh, so it's a price, it was the price to pay uh, when we see how revolution are uh, turning or turned in the past in many uh, countries. Uh, we can say that we are happy that that's uh, the only price. But we have to check that. And the main focus of this government today is to check the, the, the economic issues. So we are not here uh, for a long time. So we are supposed only to focus on short term uh, issues. Uh, but uh, we, we think that uh, we have anyhow to start some reforms for our economy. And uh, the main reforms, like I said to you, is uh, to restructure the subsidies, uh, to rationalize them, to reduce the weight of the subsidies <coughs> on the budget of the state. Uh, as well, we have to, uh, to see how uh, to push uh, the development. Uh, one of the uh, issues in Tunisia that uh, this last 20 years, there was uh, a growth, but unbalanced growth between the inland and the coast uh, areas. And it was one of the reasons for that revolution, because the source or uh, uh, the beginning of the revolution was made in this inland area, which were not uh, developed as the coast, uh, the coast area. So we have as well to review our bank uh, banking system. So we mentioned an audit and uh, uh, we have to restructure it. It will be a deep uh, fundamental work to allow a good financing of uh, our economy. Uh, all the national companies as well. Uh, the trend today uh, is to push for private initiative, for private investment, for private economy, and uh, to try to reduce the role of the state I think that uh, for economists here, we will not discover new things. We have to, to do the same job that is done uh, everywhere and it shows uh, the efficiency uh, of that. So we have many issues to check for the economy, uh, but we have as well to take care about the reforms. And the way we will proceed to, the, to make these uh, big reforms, it is because it's a concern for the whole society, is uh, uh, to use the same uh, recipe, come on, the recipe. Uh, so we'll uh, we'll try to involve uh, all uh, the big uh, political parties, but to go through this dialogue through the quartet, uh, through the constituent uh, uh, parliament, and uh, to launch a national dialogue about these big uh, questions, to be sure that we have the support. Uh, to be sure that uh, it will be handled. And you know, for the reforms, you need some sacrifice uh, by the beginning, and to be sure that we have people around us to support these sacrifices. Uh, I will not uh, make a longer speech, okay? I will prefer maybe to give you the opportunity uh, for an interactive discussion. So thank you for listening to me, and I'm open to uh, your questions. Thank you, Mr. Jamal. Uh, I'm really delighted and honored to have you with us at Columbia University. This is a very special moment, uh, an exciting one for me personally. 
Uh, we now move to the Q&A segment, and uh, let me come specify the rule of the game. Uh, the question should be short. Uh, you may make sure that you receive the microphone before you speak. Make sure that your questions are concise. Speak slowly and clearly, because the Prime Minister is jet lagged. So, uh, <laughs> so you need to be aware of I think that you will translate in French, uh, in Arabic, and then right. <laughs> translate. <you know. laughs> and uh, just to begin, I'd like to ask the Prime Minister, this is a sort of station, a simple marketing question. I'm a professor of marketing, and the only thing I know is marketing. So, uh, since you are appointed as a Prime Minister, you are working incessantly, tirelessly, to lure foreign investors to Tunisia. Today, I heard that you met with uh, the Google chief, uh, Eric Schmidt and we tried to convince him to invest in Tunisia. Right? So why should foreign investors come to Tunisia? What is the comparative advantage of Tunisia? What are the rationale? What are the main reasons that you give them? Uh, that's kind of my simple marketing question. Uh, it's a simple question, but I need 15 minutes to answer. <laughs> 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 I think there is uh, many reasons. Uh, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's try. If you want, you can sit there now. If you can okay, I think that maybe it's better. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Tunisia, it's, uh, it's an open land for investors. And uh, even uh, during the revolution period, uh, all uh, the companies who were presenting, or almost the majority of the companies who were present uh, in Tunisia, uh, they still there and they increased their investments. That's why the level of the foreign investment did not was not reduced in a big uh, in a big way. Uh, so today uh, there is fundamental reasons and there is uh, reasons linked to the to the period that we uh, with this uh, peaceful and negotiated issue with the, the labor, uh, with the the vote of the Constitution uh, with the new atmospheric climate in Tunisia, uh, we can give the visibility that the investors were expecting and lost these three uh, last years. But more than that, when you see the position, the geographical position of Tunisia, it's in the intersection of three big areas. Your first, you know that our first partner is European Europe. We are making more than around 80% of our trade exchanges and economy is with Europe in the both sense, in both directions. Uh, we are part of the Middle East or the Arabic area. And uh, you know that we speak Arabic. I, I think that we don't discover that. <laughs> uh, we are in Africa. And you know what is the future expecting and starting in Africa. So. Really, that's for the geographical resources now. Uh, one of the best choice of Tunisia, uh, just after the independence, is to invest in education. And today, you have a standard of education, a level and rate of education in Tunisia, which is at uh, the level of the European standard. And I think that you know some of the students here, you can judge by yourself about the level of education in Tunisia. So we have resources. And these people is open to these three different areas. Uh, they, we are open to their culture. We are open to their languages. Uh, we speak the same language. We treat in the same way. Uh, so it's main and fundamental factors that interests each investor to be in that area. And uh, I have to add an important one, uh, what is the competitiveness of the Tunisian uh, resources. Uh, I experimented that in my previous experience. We, have, uh, we set up an enterprise and really uh, with some training you can get skilled resources uh, with the competitiveness uh, cost. So for all of that, uh, it's really, and we have a tradition to uh, to, for, uh, to, for, for the foreign investors. For all of that, Tunisia uh, not only uh, is a good place, but it could be like a hub for investors. 
many of that when we discuss with them, and that's part of the meeting that I got this morning, are interested by the, uh, this space. In fact, they cannot do and decide uh, just one month after uh, this uh, solving, after the solving of the problem, they have to wait and study. But for the long term, Tunisia could be one of the best uh, investment land in the area. And tell me, uh, let me uh, tell, tell, tell you something. You are in business maturity. Uh, I don't like to speak about uh, Tunisia as a spring uh, Arab country, but as a democracy sector. Democracy and democracy sector. That's <laughs> how I would like to promote Tunisia. Thank you. So uh, we can go with. So we can start with one question, please. Go ahead, yeah. Okay. My name is uh, Omar Laribi. I'm from uh, I work at United Nations here in Tunisia. And let me, uh, on behalf of the Tunisian here and on my compliments, welcome you, Mr. Prime Minister, and the delegation with you. We're happy that you are here. And I, let me let you, you are Team Tunisia. You are Tunisia Angel. <laughs> <laughs> I just have a minute now. I have a question. You said that you required it, helped you, or helped the consensus, uh, the build, to build the consensus, the political consensus, and, uh, say, and to create this, uh, the new uh, government. Now, would you, I, I feel from here, from, from far, from New York, that the labor loan is also can be a problem now. Why there is no social tools? Why there is no hudna, social hudna in Tunisia now to deal with the economy? Thank you very much. So the question is about the power of the labor union in Tunisia and how to deal with it. Okay, you know, <coughs> we prefer to have a partner, a powerful partner, than we. And uh, we see, we saw that during the crisis, we were happy to have this powerful partner. Uh, why we still uh, have some uh, social troubles? I think because we cannot change things in one day. But uh, in the meantime, I think that things will progress in the next few uh, weeks. And uh, what is positive that uh, we're still uh, discussing and exchanging in an open way. It could be some frustration for some people, really. But that's, a, that's, that's the behavior of uh, the collective behavior. You have some inertia. And uh, I'm confident that uh, we will find uh, the right way to solve the economic problem. And one of the way is this peace social. Thank you. We can take a question from here, this lady. Thank you. Um, Marisa Babu from uh, UBS. So my question is, what's the realistic timeline to get to the, to the election? So you're talking about a lot of achievement, I think, that needs to be done. So realistically, how much time are we talking about? My second question would be, in order to bring security, I think it's important to have also accountability. So for people or individuals or organizations that were responsible for the lack of security, either before or after, after the revolution, is to have them to bring them to justice or to get them accountable. So are there plans for that? <coughs> So oh, for the elections, we have uh, a commitment is to organize them before the end of the year. Uh, there is some difficulties. And you know that uh, as a head of the government, I'm not responsible for the organization. I'm responsible uh, to give the right climate and uh, the, all the means to allow this, organi uh, this organization. Because one of uh, the choices that we made in Tunisia is to give the responsibility of the organization of uh, this election to the right instance of uh, elections. So uh, there is some difficulties, maybe it could be there, but we are putting all our efforts to allow uh, that to happen before the end of the year, because it's as well the interest of the country to turn the page this particular transition as soon as possible and give possibility, uh, visibility uh, to all of us and uh, to all of our partners. Uh, 
uh, for the security. Uh, I'm not sure that I understood your question, but let me answer it. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, I will answer it in the way I, I like. <laughs> responsibilities it's important you know if you want to spend all your time looking for the responsibility we need some decades because you cannot say I will stop in 2011 or 2010 or, but in the meantime uh, each time we discover a responsibility you know uh, today we voted this constitution and we made this revolution uh, to uh, to ensure the respect of the law so the rule today, each time we find anyone, any responsible who escaped from the frame of the law, he is under uh, the, the law. Investigation. Under the law. 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 Welcome here, Mr. Prime Minister. My name is Alfred Stepan. I'm a specialist in the democratization of the world. I'd like to hear what you said that you consider your country not really in the Arab Spring, but a new democracy. I think it's a new democracy, too. And, and uh, it's extremely exciting. From that viewpoint, and that's a very positive question, um, what do you think are critically the two or three most important things you you could do, be able to do, in your admittedly brief period, but it's an incredibly important period, uh, to move democracy further in some of the tricky areas. You mentioned security. Is there anything more you could do in relation between secularists uh, and the Islamists? They were tense, but never as tense as they were in Egypt. But there's probably a bit more that could be done there. You mentioned your way. So thank you. Thank you. I think the best thing that we can do uh, to ensure uh, and to have for democracy uh, is to restore the authority of the state and the authority of the law. That's the only way to guarantee the community and the respect of the democracy. And you know, with the, with the revolution, uh, the state was shaped in its institution, in its rules, in its uh, respect. And uh, that's why we will really work hard to restore that. That's the second is to develop the value of the work. Because as well, uh, when you see the productivity uh, uh, indicators uh, with the, the, the three uh, last years, uh, they are not the best. Uh, we did not progress. So uh, it's maybe surprising to say that, but I'm sure that we cannot uh, guarantee the democracy where we don't have development and we cannot guarantee democracy if we don't have a state with uh, respect of laws and, uh, and rules and institutions. So that's the contribution. About the Islamists, uh, I should say that uh, we should not uh, confuse uh, the, 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 let's say, the, the religious reference parties that we have in Tunisia. Uh, uh, some of them are extremists and, and with important theology, and you see that uh, they don't have a, a big space to find Tunisia. They are rejected by the society. And that's why we succeeded to give them some, uh, we beat them to fight them, because they don't have uh, a chance to grow in Tunisia. Tunisia is a moderated people. For the others, you see that the constitution were voted by more than 92%. And this constitution is a secular one. It was voted by what you call Islamists. So I don't think that we have to worry in the long term. Uh, these three years was uh, bad for the economy, but it was a good occasion for everyone to understand that the only position in Judaism today is in the middle. On this side? <coughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Um, uh, 
Thank you. We have to go to this side here. This lady is waiting uh, with, with the microphone. Yeah, here. Hi, Mr. President. 
Minister. Um, I'm going to ask you the question for the Um My question is, on, I'll, I'm going to build up on what Professor Kamal said. We're talking about foreign investments, and um, we were, we're talking about foreign investments everywhere. But did you, did you uh, think about invest, internal investment as well? Because we see like there's very low focus on internal investment as well, while like, it's trying to do that most sustainable way. Yes, of course, uh, we, because I am in the United States, I speak uh, about the foreign investment, but we have to start with uh, internal investment. Uh, the situation is the same, they need uh, visibility, and uh, you know that uh, the, the Chamber of Trade and, uh, and Industry was part of the dialogue and the processes, the legal processes, and now they are fully supporting that, and uh, they are uh, really pushing to invest and to invest. So it's important that we respond. Okay, uh, this side now. Uh, in the back, what back? The red shirt? Yeah. Red shirt. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I think Tunisia is a successful example for consensus, but my question what did Tunisia and the Tunisian government is willing to do to reform state institutions? And that's relevant to the question on security institutions. What has happened to state institutions and what process of reform did it take place in the state? institution that produced the repression, violence, what has changed? What has changed in the, the function of the institutions itself? And what's what's supposed to happen with regard to the state institution <coughs> in the state of the Yeah, it's uh, how to form the casket. <laughs> 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 Uh, you speak about uh, now, uh, for, for example, for the police reform. Uh, nowadays, the change will be changed. So first, you, you, you have to understand the situation of the police. Uh, it was considered by the population as uh, a tool of the autocracy, of, uh, of, autocracy, of the autocracy, and uh, so there was. Uh, uh, a gap, a large white gap between population and uh, and uh, the police. Uh, now uh, things are better, so they understood uh, their position. Uh, people understood as well that we need the police, we need security, and the relationship is really improved uh, on all what we are doing today. Even against terrorism, we go through justice. It's, everything is at, uh, under control, really. And uh, each time we have uh, a complaint, we investigate. And we have to investigate through a charge. It's not 100% uh, efficient or pure. And it's normal because it's a process, but you can believe me, uh, it has no relationship, no comparison. What, uh, with what we, uh, we, we got before. Thank you. So this side, there's a question here. Thank you. Prime Minister, uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate you for uh, your work and all the changes in Tunisia. I know it's been a, a lot of uh, difficult uh, times. Um, you spent many years in France and uh, I'd like to know how you'd like to see our, the relationship with France to be in the future years, politically and also uh, economically. So, uh, yes, uh, I spent uh, more than 24 years in France, and maybe I will spend more like, later. <laughs> uh, anyhow, you know, France is the first partner of Tunisia, and we have historical uh, relationship. Uh, with France, but, but since the revolution, and uh, let's say, to be honest, since uh, one year, we have good political relationship. Economical relationship, uh, we're growing always, whatever uh, the, relation, the political relationship were. But uh, <coughs> now with the, the government of uh, the President Hollande, we have good relationship, and uh, we are organizing uh, a visit to France. Uh, we are Fixing and speaking about the date, uh, I'm sure it will happen in the near future. 
and uh, it's important for us to continue to strengthen this relationship, and we have a lot to do there. All right. Yeah, you wait long. Good evening. My name is uh, Riyad Junsi from Radio Middle East FM, a producer and founder. Uh, we talked a lot about economy in during the last three years, uh, but we have a very important question that I really like to know your answer, and the Tunisian people would like to know your answer. We understand that this government came into ceasefire between all in the political mess in Tunisia. But right now, since you have the chance to govern, I would like what the Tunisian government position in what happening in Syria, because Syria is also an Arab country, and there is a lot of blood that has been spilling down there. And uh, we know, as we see uh, for the last three years, that Tunisia was taking sides based on uh, uh, the support of al uh based on the Islamists, uh, and you know, the whole, the whole deal, the whole things. But we are, you know, when uh, your government came in, we were like, had hope, came back, that we can stay between the parties and we can bring these parties that in Syria, bring that mess and that blood that's spilling in Syria to an end. So I would like to know what's your government position about this. Okay. Thank you. So I will remind you uh, of rule in this government with uh, uh, concerning the relationship uh, with uh, different countries. Uh, we have a clear line. We are looking to develop a friendly relationship with all these friendly countries. The second rule is uh, uh, we, have, we don't have to uh, interfere. We don't have to interfere uh, with internal issues in all the countries. Uh, for Syria, uh, what we decided to do is to get an administrative uh, presence because we have people living there and uh, uh, the obligation of any state is to give the service of all the citizens whatever they are. Uh, for the rest we hope a peaceful <coughs> solution for this nice country Syria. That's what I can tell you as a direct answer to that. Yes. Uh, first, welcome, uh, Mr. Prime Minister. Sam Garbouri, Emerging Markets Trader. Uh, I've read recently a report from the World Bank uh, about the cryonism, about nepotism of the uh, previous regime, and it seems that it managed to handle all the investment code in its favor, uh, take profit, and and to um, restrain competition. But the, 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 what worries me the most is that the same investment code is still here for three years. It didn't it, uh, change, it seems. And I heard a lot about uh, problems for all other businessmen that's trying to start businesses in Tunisia, but faced a lot of issues. I have the example of Mr. Friha present here. And I heard that it took a year to launch the aviation uh, company. So, uh, <laughs> he, he paid you? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> because I know Mr. Greta and he's a good speaker. <laughs> yeah. he's not speaking I'm speaking in general, so it's an example. Uh, yeah. just, just to show that it exists. But it's, it's not the right example. <laughs> it, it, took, it took him two years to launch his aviation company, and I think other examples yeah. of people that tried to, for example, and he, and find solution for EDNR. And they made they met a lot of issues due to the, the investment uh, code in Tunisia. So any expected change in the short end uh, of this investment code in Tunisia? No, he, two two things about Mr. Freha. I think that he can express his concerns if there is, and I think uh, because I know Mr. Freha, it has no uh, link with the investment code. Now I will answer you about the investment code. In fact, since three years, there was a revision of the investment code. And to be honest with you, uh, today, with 
or without the existing investment, it's not the reason to boost or not to boost. The most uh, important issue was the lack of visibility because of the trouble uh, caused by this uh, political dispute and uh, this change in Tunisia. Uh, now, uh, it's a good question because uh, we are uh, really thinking about, uh, we don't know exactly, we have to discuss it in the next uh, uh, meeting of, uh, of uh, ministers, uh, whether we keep the existing one, but we change two or three <coughs> main uh, clauses in it, which corresponds to, the, to this uh, period and helps to relaunch and to boost the investment or to change the whole codes. Because I'm not sure that uh, this code uh, is the main region uh, to boost or not to boost the investment. So the question is open and we have to decide in the few, uh, in the near future whether we revise it or just to <coughs> take the decision, two or three uh, actions to help uh, resulting and prevention. Okay, uh, the lady on the back. Lecture. Uh, Mr. Ali, uh, CBS alum, and um, I work with the International Finance Corporation of the World Bank Group. Um, I was curious as to, beyond the investment code, whether the government of Tunisia had any other plans in improving uh, the ease of doing business for startups. Uh, my understanding is that it's a highly regulatory, regulated environment. Um, affecting 60% of the sectors in the economy, and uh, this creates barriers for entry, particularly for startups. So I'd be curious as to know what kind of reforms or other measures the government has in mind to address this. Uh, so it depends on the sector, in fact, uh, because uh, we have some sectors which uh, where it's easy uh, to make uh, to make business, to set up a company, and to, to invest, and for others, there is limited and some, some restriction. And in general, uh, uh, to be honest with you, uh, on my point of view, since I'm coming from uh, the business, uh, have a business background, I don't like uh, the laws and administration. More they put laws, more they are happy. And uh, for investors, less we have uh, laws, uh, more we are uh, happy. Uh, what we really try to do is really to make any administrative approach shorter and uh, to make uh, lean low to lean, uh, the lean manufacturing you know lean manufacturing we will, we will make the lean in the laws in the rules uh, in the administration approach to make it easier and uh, we are uh, trying as well uh, to do it as quick as possible to have uh, uh, one uh, stop shut off because uh, as well, uh, there is the complexity of uh, some administrative of the restrictions, but as well, uh, sometimes it's time consuming for some sectors. And uh, for investors, if they could do that in one day, uh, they prefer. So we try to do that. We will not make a big revolution, but sometimes some uh, small decision would help. Samir, you can propaganda, Professor. Professor Trabitsi, Professor of Accounting, Brock University, Canada. Uh, professor, did you ask the marketing question? I'm going to ask an accounting question because I know only accounting. So, now you, you have been talking about this low productivity, you know. And is there a way, like, besides taking anything, just to promote? in the Tunisian that they have to work more and get less. Because we see all this fight in the media, you know? And everybody's watching the media, is thinking that these guys has no idea about discussion. Is there a way just to make this media <coughs> responsible, to be aware that we need at this stage, at this point of time, we need to promote that we need to sacrifice. You've got to work more and get less. 
Let's express uh, that in a different way. To ask the to ask the Tunisian people for sacrifice. And that's, uh, uh, I think that it has the same meaning. Uh, not for the media, you know, because the control cannot do more that, and we are not looking to do that. And even for the media, uh, it was, uh, you know, there was uh, were uh, and the pressure and the oppressive, and then the opening the cocoot, the cocoot. Uh, and I think in the media as well there is enough wise people now, and uh, I'm listening to them and uh, to, uh, to 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 make the world to to to, to push the media uh, to play a role uh, they are expected now, but we cannot do that by uh, making pressure on them. Now we have to make uh, to let them work in a free way. And uh, like you and me, they are Tunisian, and uh, when they are aware, they will play their role. The follow-up question is oh, about... Samir, uh, 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 we have to... Samir. There is research. Samir. Well, probably, yeah. <laughs> 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 okay, so Professor, <laughs> Professor Stiglitz is another lawyer in economics uh, and Professor of Economic Business School. Would like to say a question or probably a comment? <laughs> Please. <laughs> Please. Uh, well, uh, there's a question in me by the comment. I, I've had a, a good fortune of being able to visit uh, Tunisia several times since the uh, 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 Arab Spring. Uh, and and it, it, there have been moments where things have been very tense. Uh, and, and I really think that the fact that they got in the Constitution and brought it together in the way that you described it uh, is very important and really is a, a uh, harbinger of good things uh, to come. Uh, in your talk, you referred explicitly, though, to one of the problems that have created the conditions of the, of the, of the uh, Arab Spring, which was the inequality, the inequality both across people but across regions. And you didn't have a chance to talk about any of the specifics about how you're thinking about addressing uh, those inequalities. You want to Talk a little bit. Yeah, uh, you know, since we don't have a long time to do uh, big, uh, big things and to clarify good things, uh, we chose the way to go on the crowd and to push all uh, the projects which are stopped. And believe me, it's a big leverage to do a quick wins in the area that we can show to the people and uh, that we can make them comfortable that we are into trend to improve the situation. Because there is a big frustration three years after the revolution. Uh, they think that things in their area are worse than before. So, uh, and uh, because we can planify for new projectors since we don't execute them in quick way and in the right way, it doesn't matter. So our priority today to be on the ground and I started visiting this area with the team and uh, we put another way to do things is to get the team from all the departments and to send them on that area to check all the problems and to take the decision. If we do that, I think that we can restore their hope to see their areas developed uh, and positively. Thank you very much for this honest exchange. Uh, reports that have really bestowed on you three challenging tasks of security, economy, and uh, election. That's quite a daunting task. Uh, so, but the Tunisian people, most importantly, have entrusted you with a huge, heavy historical responsibility. Uh, and I have no, and you have no choice but to succeed. And failure is not a choice for you. You have to succeed. But despite all the challenges, I believe you will, and inshallah, I will most have to speak with some uncertainty here. Uh, but I, I believe that you will succeed in your extraordinary, given your extraordinary capability and leadership, and you have a great government with integrity and competency, and I think all the indicators show that you are moving in the right direction. Thank 
The most important thing is that Tunisia will be the first democracy in the, in the Arab world. <laughs> it has, as you said, the best educated population in the Arab world. And uh, thanks to the vision of its founding father of modern Tunisia, Habib Bourguiba. I need to be thankful <laughs> In Tunisia, our women have equal or more right. I'm speaking from experience here. And they are all active in every aspect of the civil society. And that will keep us uh, you know, optimistic. And the last point is that Tunisia is very tolerant. It's a very progressive country, and I'm proud to say it. We have more than 3,000 years of history. We have the Roman, we have the Carthaginian, the Phoenicians, the Byzantinian, the Muslims, the Turkish, we have all of them, and the Spanish. And so we are tolerant, we are modern, and you cannot lose with those. As a matter of fact, uh, I was surprised, uh, I'm not surprised actually, that Tunisia was one of the earliest countries to recognize the United States and establish the trade agreement as early as 1795. So this is really impressive about our uh, openness to the world. Before I close, I'd like to thank uh, my friend and Minister Tofik Zlasi for his help in arranging this. Without him, I don't think we'll be here. I would like uh, to thank my friend uh, Munji Hamdi, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, and of course, Ambassador of the United States, of uh, Tunisia and United States, uh, Mr. Khaled Khiari. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you here with us. We are proud of you, and we wish you the best luck. So, good luck, to Mr. Joma. Good luck on your meeting with, uh, with President Obama. Tell him that you came to his alma mater here. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> may God bless Tunisia to fulfill, fulfill the aspiration of its own people. Thank you very much. Thank you.